Hello and welcome once again to Crime Watch, a chance to do something to help cut crime. As always, the programme's live, actual witnesses take part in our reconstructions and detectives on the cases here are gathered together with BBC researchers waiting for your call. Four months ago, we featured the case of a 17-year-old girl who was raped after leaving a disco in West London. She very courageously worked with the Crime Watch team in filming a reconstruction of the conversation she'd had with her attacker. As a result of that film, nearly 300 viewers rang with information, and a man is now in custody awaiting trial at St Albans Crown Court later this month. Now tonight, we have to ask you to help on another quite separate case. The victim is again a 17-year-old girl. She was persuaded to get into a car late at night after leaving a nightclub. In this case, the girl who we'll call Sarah had just left the Hammersmith Palais in West London where she'd spent the evening dancing and drinking with a group of friends. She too has helped us with the filming by describing what happened to her, although her appearance and her voice have been disguised. And you'll also hear the voice of her younger brother describing certain events after the attack, although an actor takes his part in vision. Our reconstruction starts in King Street in Hammersmith. The night of Friday the 1st of March has become the small hours of Saturday the 2nd of March. I hadn't been in a good mood all evening and I'd even been round with my best friend. It was that time of the month. Come in to get something. Oh, come on, it's half past two. I'm not hanging around here, I'm going. What's the matter with you? You've been in a bad mood all evening. We'll go and get something to eat and then we'll go. Well, you go. I've had enough, I'm off. Oh, sir, you can't go home on your own. Just stop being so difficult. Look, I'm going to get a cab. You do what you like, OK? But, sir, you haven't got any money. I've got your keys. She hasn't got any money at all? No. Are you a cab? Yeah, but I'm not working tonight. Just let her go if she wants to. But I've got a case. I'm supposed to be staying at her house. She hasn't got any money. All right, I'll go and talk to her. Look, where are you going? You can't walk home on your own. Come back and wait for the rest of us. Oh, leave me alone. I've told you I'm tired. I'm going home. For being really stupid. Come back and don't be so silly. Get off me! If you're gonna be like that, forget it. Do you want to lift? Do you want to lift? Yeah. But I've got to go back to my friend. She's got my money and my keys. She's just up the road. Where do you want to go to? Cheswick High Road. It's Victoria Street. Sure, get in. It was about 30. He had a young manner. He sounded like he had a London accent, with a hint that he came from abroad. Was that your boyfriend you was with? No, he's not my boyfriend. Why were you arguing? I've just been in a bad mood all evening. He talked excitedly, wanting to know where I'd been, who I'd been with. Just general conversation, really. Who did you go with? There's a crowd of us that usually go, but for some reason I just didn't enjoy myself tonight. <laughs> I sometimes feel like that. You hear what I'm saying? What's your name? Sarah. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Nothing. It's just you remind me of a friend of mine who's half cast as well. That's all. <laughs> it's back there. Oh, it's OK. We can turn just up here. Oh, it's a shortcut. I want to go home. I kept saying that I just wanted to go home. And he knew I wanted to go home. I realised that I'd have to make myself remember certain things about him in the car. He was wearing a silver watch with a black face and wearing a light-coloured shirt 
in blue jeans. The car was a light colour with four doors and the back car seat was maroon plastic with little holes like perforations. The seats in front were a different style and colour. He drove the car towards Green Dragon Lane in Brentford and I told him that it was back the other way. He told me that he'd turn the car around but instead he drove into the car park under one of the blocks of flats where he raped me. Afterwards, they drove me home, and I was hysterical. My mum, my dad, and my sister, and at the police station, and I was at home with my sister's friend. Well, I'll get this probably the pizza man. Right. Does Sarah live here? Yes. Are you Sarah's sister? No. Oh. Is she OK? Yeah, she's fine. Uh, only I picked her up in Hammersmith. She was outside the town hall. She was very drunk. She didn't know where she lived. I thought she was taking a long time. So I went to the door. She was fighting with the boy. Was the boy she fighting with wearing a baseball jacket with Chicago on? Yeah. Yeah, well, I know who that was. Is she all right? Hi, are you Sarah's brother? Yeah. Hi. Is Sarah OK? Yeah, she's fine. Well, I just finished work and I saw her fighting with someone. It was, it was by Hammersmith Town Hall. And... As soon as he said he'd picked up my sister last night, I realised it was a man who'd raped her. Away from him, you know. And she said, yes, I'd want to go home. So I said, well, get in. And she said, she, well, she really wasn't sure where she was going. It's cold out here. I was terrified of what he might do and shaking. But I didn't well, want him to know that anything was wrong and that everyone was at the police station. And she said, no, I didn't mean Brentford, I meant Hounslow. <laughs> so we drove to Hounslow. <laughs> then she said, well, I don't live here, sorry. I said, seriously, where do you live? I wanted to get a good look at him so I could describe him. He looked sort of Brazilian to me with a very round face and square chin. His eyes were very distinctive, really small and piggy. So we were driving around Chiswick, and I asked her, where does she live in Chiswick? And, and then she told me. He was very jumpy and nervous, and he kept shaking and jiggling his keys. So I let her out. <laughs> Is she OK? She's fine. He smiled a lot, have massive grin lines. It was like a fake smile. Bye. Bye. It's him, isn't it? I know. Bye. My mum, my dad and my friends are all helping me now. But please, don't let this happen to someone else. If you know anything, please let Crime Watch know. Well, Mr. Lovering, the first question to ask you is why would the attacker go back to the victim's house the following evening? This was not a logical action. On the one hand, I think he went there to see if his 17-year-old victim had recovered. On the other hand, I think he went there to see if she'd reported the rape to the police. I suppose he needed to see if she'd recovered because, although we didn't show it in the film, he did use physical violence against her, didn't he? That's correct, sir. What's the description of the man? He's aged 30. Mediterranean appearance, five foot seven, afro hair, which is short. He has a round face and a square chin. And we know certainly that he's of mixed race, possibly half West Indian or Southern European. Um, Sarah described him as having a young manner. He's dressed quite youngly, but what she didn't, did she mean about the young manner? When she says aged 30 or thereabouts, he used various phrases which tended to show that he was young in his manner, his way, such as, you know what I say, you hear what I say. Do you remember he was wearing a distinctive watch? What was that like? The watch is extremely interesting to us. We believe he wore it on his right wrist, which tends to show that he's left-handed. It had a black face, 
a silvery elasticated strap. So that may have been worn on his right wrist, in which case he may have been left-handed. The car, we don't know the make of car, but there were a few distinctive points about it. Unfortunately, we do not know the make. It was light in colour. It had, on its rear seat, small perforated holes. On the rear window, as you looked at it, there were sun blinds. Together, it tends to point to being a foreign car. So there's a possibility it was a foreign car. I know you do feel there's quite a deal of urgency in finding this man. This man, I believe, has struck before. We do need to find him. If there are other victims out there watching this programme, I want them to understand they can come and contact me in all confidence. And that um, there's going to be a sympathetic response? The Metropolitan Police has completely restructured, restructured its investigative role in rape. We are compassionate. There are female as well as male officers who have been trained to look after victims of rape. Well, Mr Lovering, thank you. If you feel perhaps you've encountered this man, if you think you can help in any way, your call will be treated with absolute discretion. The essential thing is to prevent an attack like this happening to somebody else. To remind you of the number here, it's 081 811 8181. Or the number direct to Tom Lovering's colleagues at New Scotland Yard is this one, 071 230 2301. That's 071 230 2301. Calls to crime watch really are highly effective. I must say, I hope, though, we do rather better tonight than last month. If you recall, the calls looked uh, very promising at first, but progress on all three reconstructions has been rather frustrating. There were, though, two arrests from photo call, one just ten minutes after we came off the air. Police called at a pub in Bristol after two quite separate viewers rang with the address there. A man who worked there had heard he was on crime watch. He was actually sitting, waiting for the detectives. His case has now been referred to the Director of Public Prosecutions. The second arrest came two days later after information from several viewers was combined. A woman has since been charged with handling stolen checkbooks and obtaining money by deception. Now to this month's photo call, here to take us through the faces of Superintendent David Hatcher and DC Jackie Haynes. We're very anxious to speak to this man, Keith Alexander Burgess, in connection with the death of 24-year-old Leslie Bennett. Leslie was a popular young woman who had just graduated from Manchester Polytechnic. On Friday the 1st of March, she was found dead at her home in Kenton, Middlesex. She'd been strangled. Keith Burgess is 31, six foot with an athletic build. He has light brown hair which he usually wears gelled back and has a half inch scar under his bottom lip. He speaks with a slight Scottish accent, most noticeable when he's agitated. If you think you've seen Keith Burgess or you know where he is now, please phone us here at Crime Watch. And you know who this is. Wearing the same outfit, he's robbed two building societies up north. He struck first in Stockport in January and then again just over a month later in Warrington. Both times he threatened staff and customers with his gun. He seems rather fond of his blue woolen hat and blue anorak. He's 25 to 30 and about 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10. He's got dark hair and wears an earring in his left ear. If you do know him, please get in touch. Officers in Leeds would like to speak to this man, Robert Albert Spencer. They're investigating a peculiar series of events in West Yorkshire. St James's Hospital in Leeds was tricked into giving accommodation to a man who called himself Dr O'Brien during November last year. Leeds General also had a visit from the bogus doctor. He was disturbed going through patients' records. And to staff at the Bradford Infirmary, he became a familiar figure. Dressed in a white coat, he'd wander around the wards and chat to his new med medical colleagues. Robert Spencer is 45 years old, 5 foot 11, with a heavy build. He dresses smartly, is well-spoken, and we think he changes his hair colour from mid-brown to black. He's clean-shaven and sometimes wears glasses for effect. Mr Spencer travels with his dog, Sandy. He's also known as Dr Boyd, Dr Chapman, Dr Dunn and Alan Townsend. If you know where he is, please call us tonight. Finally, my London colleagues want to find this man who managed to con a Mayfair gambling club. Here he is on the 6th of March joining the club in central London. He gave false details, calling himself Peter Brown. I've got another little... Brown in there. Oh, I'm afraid it's not possible because no there's problem. no one to sign you in. You have to be signed in by a manager. No problem. Licensing laws in this country are very strict. Yeah. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. 
Two days later, this time wearing glasses, he went back to the casino, making elaborate arrangements to meet his friends. Did I speak to you earlier? Yes, you did. I just saw him in the background, because I just can't believe I'm going to get in touch with these people at the moment. He left with £52,000 in cash. He's described as 5 foot 10 to 6 foot in his early 30s and, as you hear, he has an East End accent. If you have any idea who or where he is or any of our other photo call faces, please phone us now. And the number to ring is always 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. Next week is National Crime Prevention Week, the first of its kind. It's aimed at making us all aware of our own role in combating crime. Each day will have its own theme. Car thefts, home security and so on, with the emphasis on how to take care of yourself and of your possessions. But how good would you be as a witness if you saw a crime take place? Would you intervene? Would you remember anything of any use? With the help of Hampshire Police, we asked three people to take part in an experiment. Now, I must say it's not remotely scientific, but nonetheless, you might find it quite interesting. We told our witnesses they were about to see a crime. We told them because it could have badly frightened them otherwise. And then we staged events in front of them. We start in Winchester at an off-license, which helps us to set up our experiment. Our witnesses were positioned so they'd each have different views. In a passing taxi was Marion Skidmore, a neighbourhood watch coordinator who lives on the south coast. My neighbour was burgled about four years ago now. Um, so it was because of that that we eventually got involved in neighbourhood watch. I've never actually witnessed a crime, but I would like to think that I would be a good witness. Eli Weir is in his final year studying drama. Being a drama student, you need to be able to see particular people in a certain way. If I did witness a crime, I think I'd be able to describe what the basic essence of that person was by seeing them maybe once or twice quickly. Jean Hanley is a grandmother and a pensioner. Well, I like to think I would be observant, because if something unusual happens, you do tend to make a special point of looking. But having never been put to the test, I can't honestly say how could I be. We asked Mrs Hanley to go and buy something from the off-licence. Hello. Have you got some sparkling wine? Oh, uh, yes, just over there, madam. Oh, great. So give me the money now. Well, there is no money. I've cashed up. You stay out of this rate. Let's get out of here! Come on, quick! very quickly. How much did our witnesses recall? Suddenly I heard the voice and it did frighten me, yes. I looked round and um, there was a man near me in a bright red sweatshirt, I think, and, and dark trousers and a, I, think, I think he had a short haircut. He seemed to me to have quite distinctive eyes. I think I could recognise him again because he was closer to me and he looked me full in the face. The other one didn't. And uh, I didn't feel I got a very good view of him, particularly. It all happened very quickly. Um, the guy came out of the shop and he ran down here and he was gone within a second. Um, I got quite a good look of the first one. The second one was behind him, so I didn't get as good a look as I could have done. One minute I was sitting inside the taxi, the next minute there was a lot of noise, an incident seemed to be happening with people rushing into a car, and the next minute I'd driven past. Compiling photo fits can happen days or weeks after the event. Our witnesses were able to compose them straight away. Here the pictures are hand-finished to fill in the details. I found making up a photo fit uh, image of the man that I saw extremely difficult. 
Um, we started with the hairline, and I immediately found there wasn't a, a hairline to suit the type of hairline that I, I'd seen. The hair could come down more, and I also found it difficult to um, produce a, a shape of mouth when, in fact, he was he was shouting and calling, and therefore it was difficult um, to see a mouth in the, in the closed position. I would like to think that my photo fit is a reasonable likeness. I suppose in marks out of ten, I would probably give it around six. It was hard to compile the, the photo fit. Um, building up an image from fleeting glances of people is quite hard. Have a look at that, see if there's, there's anything more you think we could actually do um, with that. No, I think the hair's OK. The ears are OK, the earrings are in. Yeah, the nose is OK and the eyes. I don't think there's much more we can do on it, actually. I couldn't remember the things that I thought I would be able to remember. I think I was looking more of generally instead of the more detailed things which people need to, to get a good photo fit, get a good likeness of the person. Should an, an event like that occur again, I would like to hone in more on, on features, um, ha hairline, sh sh shape of eyes, shape of face, etc. And I hope in the future that would make me a, a better witness. Well, all three of our subjects did remarkably well. How good would you have been? Well, now you can see for yourself. Here is a lineup, an identification parade of the sort that you might be asked to look through if you'd actually seen a crime take place. One of the actors who played out our so-called attempted robbery is in the lineup. Can you pick him out? We'll go down these faces twice. Which number is he on the line? Now, we've told our actor what he'd be told if he really was a suspect. And incidentally, there's nothing in the rules to stop him slightly changing his appearance. He might have changed his hairstyle, for example. He can also decide where he wants to stand. And he can object if others on the lineup don't look remotely like him. Now, remember, you've seen far more of our actor than had any of our witnesses. We've shown you uh, repeats, as it were, of the crime. And we've... Uh, covered the uh, actual faces. We've shown you the actual faces and their equivalents on photocall. So you should have a very good chance of picking him out. Who is he? Okay, have you decided? Well, here he is. It's number seven. And in case you want reminding, here's how he looked when the robbery was staged. And uh, don't forget, incidentally, Wayne Goddard is an actor. He's not a robber, so please don't call us about him. Well, next, what about the car? Do you remember anything about that? Here it is among a list of models. Can you identify which one it is? I'll give you a moment just to look through this list. Remember, once again, you've had several opportunities to see the car. If you've got the model type correctly, can you be any more specific? What version was it? Was there anything unusual about it? What color was it? And what about the registration number? Any chance of remembering that? Well, here is the car. It's white, of course, with red coach lines. It's a Ford Escort, uh, an XR3i. As for the registration, it could be false, but still useful to the police, a 631YOP. And do you remember anything else that might be useful to the police? Now look at this sequence again, for instance. Did you notice that there was a third man in our attempted robbery? He was driving that getaway car. Perhaps the lesson that comes out of this is that no one can remember everything about an incident they see, especially if it's wholly unexpected and puts the witness under some sort of stress. But do try to concentrate on specific details, particularly those that others might not have a chance to notice. It's better to be certain about a few things than vague about a lot. As I say, National Crime Prevention Week begins next Monday. Do watch out for it. So one or two distinctive features are much more useful than a, a dozen vague impressions. Observant viewers have already been calling the studio on the cases we've featured so far on the programme. Several viewers have called in putting a name to the attacker of the 17-year-old girl in Hammersmith, and that includes one call from a WPC. And we've had calls from several women who feel they will have encountered this man in the past as well, so we'll um, keep you informed on that. But perhaps you can identify something or someone in one of our incident desk cases tonight. Here are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. Good evening. Our first case tonight is a tragic one. An armed robbery which two weeks later turned into a murder investigation. 63-year-old security guard Gordon Rogers was making a delivery to the Midland Bank in Guildford. It was the morning of Thursday the 21st of February. 
two men, one armed with a gun, tried to hijack the security van. From his hospital bed, Mr Rogers explained what happened. I started struggling with him. In the end, I think he must have gave up. I wasn't going to win and he just shot me and where he went from there, I couldn't tell you. Gordon Rogers was to die from his injuries two weeks later. This is an artist's impression of the gunman who Mr Rogers thought was in his late 20s to early 30s, around 5 foot 8 with a slim build. The other man was about 30, 6 foot and had a heavy build. Maybe you saw who was driving the getaway car, a blue Vauxhall Carlton. It had been missing from Sidcup Kent since the 4th of February and in that time could have shown one of three registration numbers. D516NKN J59179 or D123CAR. Or perhaps you saw the car being abandoned at the Post House Hotel just outside Guildford. It would have been at about 11.15 a.m. There's a substantial reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the men who shot Gordon Rogers. He was killed for just doing the job he'd enjoyed for the past 24 years. So please do ring if you can help in any way. My colleagues in West Lothian are now gravely concerned for Vicky Hamilton, a schoolgirl who disappeared nearly five weeks ago. According to family and friends, Vicky was in good spirits on Sunday, February the 10th, having spent the weekend with her sister. This is what she was wearing at the time. She was on her way home that afternoon, but after going off the centre of Bathgate, where she was to change buses, she just seemed to vanish. Since then, the search has taken an ominous turn, as 11 days later, Vicky's purse was found in a gutter in the centre of Edinburgh. We know it hadn't been there long, and as far as we can tell, it's intact. Vicky is only 15 years old. Could you have seen her since February the 10th? If so, please call us here tonight. Now we urgently need your help to try and identify this little boy, because we are seriously concerned for his safety. This is an artist's impression of him which has been taken from a video seized by the Obscene Publications Squad at New Scotland Yard. The boy has three dark moles in the shape of a triangle on his left cheek. He was also wearing this type of black leather trainer, quite unusual. They've got white diamond shaped patterns on the side and a white rim around the soles. We think the video could be up to five years old, so the boy could be aged anywhere between seven and twelve. Those three moles on his left cheek are very distinctive. A parent, teacher or perhaps a doctor might recognise him. If you think you know him, please call us immediately. We need to be sure that he's alive and well. It's in fact very rare for a woman to be attacked if alone when her car breaks down. But such cases always stay in the mind. You may remember in February a woman was attacked and raped by the side of the A1. It was about quarter to six on Friday the 22nd of February when she pulled over onto the hard shoulder of the northbound A1 at the Alconbury Hill flyover in Cambridgeshire. It was dark and raining. Being the rush hour there were plenty of cars about as she walked towards the Alconbury House Hotel. On the way she passed a red saloon car which had stopped on the A604 slip road. She refused an offer of help from the driver, but only yards further on, she saw him running towards her. He raped her only 10 feet from the busy dual carriageway. He was 30 to 35, 5 foot 10 with thick brown hair and a moustache. She describes him as a businessman and remembers that he was very softly spoken and smelt of strongly of beer. When she saw him in the car, he was wearing a white shirt and a dark tie with diagonal stripes and had small square gold cufflinks. When he attacked her, he wore a light grey hooded jogging top. You may have seen him in the hotel car park because after the attack, his victim saw him drive out of there northwards. She remembers his red car had red cut-out headrests and that the seats were patterned in grey and blue. At about 6.15, someone saw him go into the Happy Eater, about two miles north on the A1, and noticed his jogging top was soaking wet. Did you see him there or anywhere else that night? If you think you recognise him, please do phone us now. This sort of attack creates fear amongst women and of course there's a lot of confusion about what you should do if your car does break down. Our advice is to get out of the car in case there's an accident on the hard shoulder. You should wait near the unlocked passenger seat, locking all the other doors. Then, if someone does approach, you can get in and lock that door. Always keep your hazard lights on. 
passing motorists should simply phone the police rather than approaching a broken down vehicle. This will ensure help comes without being frightening to the stranded motorist. Our next case seems to have all the ingredients of an American underworld killing, but it happened in a quiet Kent village. Alan Leppard was in bed when his doorbell rang on Easter Monday. It was 10.40 at night. He lived on the high street of Moncton near Ramsgate and it was here that he answered the door to two men. He was shot at point-blank range and died shortly afterwards. Were you in the area that night? The Fox Hunter Caravan Park is only yards away. Were you there over Easter? People saw two men that night driving a big American car like this. It was cruising around Moncton. Or perhaps you saw this man. He was one of Mr Leopard's visitors in his 40s with grey hair going white. If you know anything about Alan Leopard's murder or the strange events in Moncton that night, please call us here. Taxi driver Stephen Gaines thought there was nothing unusual about this passenger who he picked up from Durham Station on Thursday the 7th of February. It was about 2.40 in the afternoon and it was snowing. Cast your mind back, the man may have been hanging around outside the station or you could have been on the tra same train as him. He asked to be driven to Lanchester, then wanted to go on, and at Buttsfield he complained of feeling ill and asked Stephen to stop. As he pulled over into the lay-by, his passenger suddenly produced a large knife and attacked him. Stephen was stabbed in the stomach, but eventually managed to escape from his taxi. The attacker drove off in it, a light blue Vauxhall Cavalier. It was found abandoned the next day, outside Bear Park School, a few miles away. Did you see it being dumped there? Stephen's attacker is, is described as 5 foot 8, about 29 to 35. He has dark hair, greying at the temples, and his beard was neatly trimmed. He was wearing a navy blue padded jacket and a light coloured shirt, which may be spotted with blood. He had a local accent and must have been familiar with the area. We're hoping that this knife may be the clue that leads us to him. It was found four miles from the abandoned car, and it could well be the one used in the attack. We're very worried that this man may attack again. If you know anything about this or any of our other incident desk cases, please call us now. And if you can help, here's the number 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. Our next case is a disturbing one because it's the murder of a straightforward, well-liked man for no reason anyone can work out. John Green was in his mid-30s. He wasn't a very ambitious man, and he made a basic living from a variety of occasional jobs. Because his lifestyle was a fairly simple one, and he lived rent-free in a property belonging to his mother, he wasn't too concerned about earning money. John lived in Poole in Dorset, and police need to hear from anyone who came into contact with him, particularly in the last few days before he died. It was on the evening of Saturday the 2nd of February that John's body was found at his home. Our reconstruction begins the week before his death. John had held a party at his basement flat. It was Saturday the 26th of January. John was usually rather shy and awkward in company. But that night, in his own flat and surrounded by friends, he was relaxed and sociable. The party was to celebrate the birthday of a close friend of his, Jude Holiday. Oh, there you are. Oh, hi, Tom. All right? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I can't have some fresh air. It's so hot, oh, I know. It? It's, it's yeah. great party. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. Well, are you sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Brilliant. Okay. I'm glad I'm enjoying it, too. I'll see you yeah. later. Okay. I've known John for 15 years as a friend. He was quiet, unpretentious, shy, really, man. Uh, he had a wide range of friends. He was intelligent, active mind. All his friends would agree with me that he was a gentle giant and would never hurt a fly. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to see everybody again. I always sit up in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> The party went on into the small hours. There are still a few party-goers police need to speak to. 
They may have witnessed something significant or be able to provide some extra information about John. <laughs> Above John's basement flat is a shop which he rarely used. It was in the Branksome area of Poole on the busy main road to Bournemouth. The windows were usually whitewashed, but shortly after the party, John had scrubbed them down. The first of an unusual series of events that week was an appointment on Tuesday the 29th of January. A meeting at a roadside cafe with an unnamed person. Oh, there you are. Then on Thursday, John's next door neighbor heard shouting through the wall. No, you won't. I play well, well. You know I was pissed out of my head that night. I could hear that conversation quite clearly through the wall, and I was absolutely horrified to hear this woman threaten to knife a man. I then heard some running footsteps and quickly rushed into the lounge to look through the window and just caught a glimpse of a woman. Later that same evening, other neighbours heard shouts and thumps coming from his shop. Whatever may have happened, the following day, John seemed untroubled. In fact, this local shopkeeper, who saw him around lunchtime, said he seemed unusually cheerful. Hi, oh, hello. But only a couple of hours later, outside his shop, a witness saw someone fitting John's description and looking pale and frightened, involved in a tussle. No one seems to have seen John alive since then. The next evening, Saturday, shortly after six o'clock, a woman who had just got off the bus walked past his shop. Hello. That man could well have been seen by passengers getting on the bus. All our fares are recorded on computer. And we can tell from that that on the night in question, two concessionary fares were issued at this stop. I was the driver on that night, and I'm fairly sure that I remember two elderly women boarding at this stop and carrying on towards Paul with me. It was only moments after that that a friend of John's came to visit him. She found his body. He'd been repeatedly stabbed. Well, Mr Homer, does there seem to be any possible reason, as far as you can see, why anybody would have wanted to kill John Green? No, there doesn't, Sue. Uh, despite the fact that we've looked very carefully into John Green's background, we can't find any reason why anyone would, would want to kill him. In fact, his friends describe him as a very gentle and genial man and not the sort of person to confront people, the one that would not seek trouble. Hmm. Let's look at those um, unusual events. There are a number of them during the week before he died. There was the rendezvous at the cafe in his diary on the A33. What well, might that have been? A business meeting, perhaps? That's a possibility, but on the other hand, he could have been meeting a friend. We really don't know at the moment, and we do need to find out. What we have established is that the appointment refers to the little chef, which is on the A33, about eight miles north of Basingstoke, at a place called Heckfield. And this was Tuesday, the, January the 29th. Somebody may have seen something. Yes, and I'd like anyone that knew the reason uh, why John Green went there or who he was due to meet to come forward and give us a call tonight. The other of the mysteries was the, um, the sighting of John apparently being harassed by two men outside his shop, and that was the last time he was seen alive. Yes, and that information came to the incident room from an anonymous letter that we received, and the person obviously observed what was going on for several minutes and saw this incident going on on the other side of the road outside of John Green's shop. We also know that the author of the letter was waiting for someone to pick them up because their car had broken down. 
So the vital thing is for somebody to come forward and perhaps corroborate that sighting for you? Yes, that, that's right. I would very much like the writer of the letter to come forward. That's vitally important in my view because the letter contains information which I know is important to the inquiry. And also it's important to get the person that picked them up to come forward. Right, and that was Friday the 1st of February at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Yes, it was. And the descriptions provided by the writer of the letter are that the first man was something around 20 to 24 years of age. He was 5 feet 10 inches tall and he had light faded blue jeans with a dark blue top. And a very distinctive feature about his particular description is that he had dirty blonde hair or hair that was, herb or hair that was auburn colour with blonde highlights in it. And the second man is considerably older, at around 40 years of age, again about 5 feet 10 inches tall, but with dark hair and in need of a shave. He was much thicker set than the first man and had brown trousers on with a lighter brown zip-up top. So is there a possibility, perhaps, that one of those two men were the same man who was seen by the woman getting off the bus the following evening? Well, we can't discount that, but on the other hand, we must keep an open mind about it. It could be that that man is not, in fact, connected with the murder inquiry and for some reason doesn't want to come forward. It's very important that we do find out who that person is, and I would ask anyone that knows uh, the description of that man to come forward. And what is his description? He's, in fact, described as about six feet tall, 35 to 45 years of age, of large build and wearing denim jeans. And a distinctive feature about him was that he was wearing a very thick dark green jumper. All right, now we're talking about that shortly before John's body was found and off, off the bus, on the bus rather, got two women pensioners who you need to trace. Yes, uh, they, they were getting onto the bus at about quarter past six on Saturday the 2nd of February. We know that they purchased fares, which meant that they got off at the Shah of Persia public house at Poole, and the other one got off at an area called Upton, just outside of the town. It's very important that those two people contact us, and I'd ask them to ring us tonight. They may have important information, having been waiting at that bus stop. Right, and it's a reward in this case, isn't there? Yes, there is, and that's been provided by the family and friends of John Green, and it currently stands at £13,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of John Green's killers. And we're determined that we would like to get to the bottom of that. Mr Homer, thank you very much indeed. If you knew John and you haven't yet made contact with the police, or if you can offer any new information to help discover why anyone would want to kill him, please do phone. The number to the studio here is 081 811 8181, or you can ring the incident room in Poole, and that number is 0202. 70 That's 0202, the code for pool, 70 There's quite a volume of calls coming in tonight on the Chiswick rape. Several people think that they've seen the rapist in the Hammersmith area of London. We've had a number of women call. It's quite possible that there are other, some other rape victims among those callers. And uh, some suggestions about uh, his car or a cab company he could be working for. Uh, police are quite optimistic about the Warrington robber. We've got uh, callers suggesting names. As I say, the police seem to think that some of those might, uh, might fit evidence they already have. Robert Albert Spencer, he's the chap wanted for uh, questioning in connection with the bogus doctor inquiry in the north of uh, England. Several possible sightings of him. As I say, quite a lot of calls coming in at the moment. We'll be back at 11.15 with Crime Watch Update. If you can't stay up till then to get the latest news, do remember most crime is relatively minor. And indeed, it can be stopped by taking sensible precautions. So don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.